So Ishan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Or or is just like old days bunking classes? I never. Eighty five percent attendance didn't let us bunk too many classes. Eighty five percent attendance. Okay, good thing. Good thing. <laughs> okay, this is uh, Ishan Mishra speaking, who was here from two thousand eight to two thousand twelve. Uh, because you took 85% seriously you also got a gold medal from the institute and uh, ishan is a is a pune boy when he came here uh, your father is a teacher also professor also right right yes so uh, i actually i taught him as undergraduate in uh, three courses in the first year including the human values uh, the value education engagement there were four ishans in that 25 or 20 or so strong uh, small group of undergraduates that we are uh, talking to uh, Rishan Mishra Rishan Mehta Rishan Agarwal Rishan Srivastava and Rishan Singh I still remember all the Rishan I think I forgot yeah. all the other students some of Rishan I remember so and Rishan uh, did very well here as I said already he was a gold medalist of the class and uh, he was working with me and uh, His classmate uh, Aditya Deshpande, they we were kind of working together in a group, all for his honors project, and we had a couple of publication from here. He went off to do his PhD at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, in computer vision. He was working here. We are doing like image processing problems, but mostly the GPU algorithms kind of thing. Like I think he's also working. You you heard Deep Shankar. He was also in the same same kind of team. Like the GPU algorithm kind of stuff, but he went and did proper computer vision in CMU. Uh, got a PhD working with Abhinav and uh, uh, who's the other advisor? Marcia, Marcia. Ah, Marcia Lebrer. And then uh, he's been at uh, Facebook AI research or Meta AI research since his graduation for the last four plus years. He's been uh, uh, he's been doing very well. He's working on the leading edge of uh, the. computer vision so before we come to that i'll i want to ask you uh, basic questions like how did you you know when did you know you want to be in the research field you, you, how did you become a researcher at least you no know, not i don't not asking about when did you get the skills but in mentally you think that you, you want to be researcher and not working the top shot executive in some google or microsoft or something was it before coming to triple it itself or after coming to triple it or after or after leaving triple it So I think there were phases. I don't think there was one particular thing, but the earliest time I actually thought that this might be a career for me was basically looking at my father because my father also did research for a very long time, um, and it was really about the fact that he, whenever he would come back, he would actually be excited about his work, which was a big difference from my other uh, like relatives who would come back and they would actually be happy that they were outside of their work, whereas my father, when he would come back, he would typically bring back a book or a paper and. like basically read it at night and so that just made me realize that he's happy doing what he's doing which is very different from what other people are they they basically come back and they feel relieved to be back at home uh, so i think that basically the sense of happiness made me realize that maybe this is something i can look into how did triple it prepare you when you looking back today how did triple it prepare you for you know what you are in the almost in the fast moving piece of research area today you also did you do anything with languages if you are in lang- large language models you may be in the even faster lane but maybe that lane is hitting a dead end now in, in the sense all the i'm i'm told the nl people are having existential crisis are they all finished computer vision people are still going so how did triple it prepare you for that i think uh, even looking back i think the four years at triple it were one of the best in my life uh I think just that environment of people having um, the students around, having like really sharp people, really motivated faculty, that was I think very critical in making me understand that if you have the right environment of people, that basically propels you to do even better. And so that basically is something I've kept to heart. So whenever I go, like whenever I moved to like CMU or when I moved here. it was really about the environment of people around me rather than the place itself which basically made made it uh, worth it so i think one of the best parts about triple it was it made me really ask questions now nothing was ever given like it taught me basically don't take anything for granted always ask questions in 
that's basically what's going to make you successful if you stop asking questions if you stop digging into the details then um, basically you you're not aiming for like uh, higher uh, higher things or like great things in life okay so when you move to uh, now cmu how is the you now the research working environment i mean cmu is a really large the you know, large groups in every one of these areas uh how does the working style there and working style or the way people think the faculty the students the university as a whole things about the problem they solve is there any how do you compare it with say triple it or anybody else anywhere else what did you notice in in cmu so one of the things that struck me as soon as like i think it was my first or second day at cmu uh, when i was talking to someone in Uh, i basically assumed everybody in the computer vision course was coming from a cs background but basically i was gravely mistaken there were people who were who had done nuclear physics in their past and who were now doing computer vision and there were people who would come from like quantum physics or theoretical physics and so basically it was a mishmash of people with really diverse backgrounds and that taught me something pretty valuable everybody thought very differently about the same exact problem just like svd singular value decomposition a roboticist thought about it very differently interpreted it very differently a nuclear physicist thought, saw it very differently and someone who came from pure math saw it very differently and so just the fact that that simple thing which i would assume at this point has been studied like thousands of times could be interpreted so differently from people with different backgrounds i think was very valuable and that continued throughout cmu so professors with very very different backgrounds uh, taught us so people who were coming from like pure mechanics a background teaching computer vision or teaching something in robotics and that really was very inspiring um uh, i think that was one of the biggest differentiators at cmu you had a large group of people that large group of people worked on the same thing but they came from very different backgrounds and very different experiences like graphics could be physics uh, could be maths could be uh, pure robotics and all of them trying to achieve the same goal um, i think that was pretty uh, inspiring uh one question about cmu life uh, how were the black fridays black fridays were okay they were not that stressful thankfully yeah. they were not that stressful to you or they were not stressful overall I, they were not that stressful to me Th- there were a couple black fridays which were hard for people but i think black fridays were good because after a point in your phd uh, so for context black fridays basically in every semester at cmu they give you a rating as a phd student whether you're, you're doing well or not and so i think beyond the point when you're when you don't have courses it's very hard to figure out when, whether you're doing well or not in undergrad i think one of the good part is you have a very like structured course space right so you get whatever grade you get a, a certain amount of gpa you know you're doing well or not whereas when you move into the open world and of course when you move into the real life things become more and more unstructured so it's very hard to say whether you're doing well whether you're actually putting your energy to the right thing so black fridays were a very i would say the re- useful tool to figure out every semester whether you're doing well or not but uh, do you think same students were stressed about it because deep shankar just said uh, that triple it all the students were happy and i was wondering aren't we running a phd program are we running some nursery school or something i don't think people were that stressed about it i think i mean at every point i think you'll always get encounter a distribution right like no matter where you go there is always going to be a distribution of people the way they tackle emotions the way they tackle pressure and so i don't think necessarily the entire student population was walking around stressed there were certain people who were more stressed there were certain people who basically did not care about the black friday piece so i asked all these questions about black friday because very recently triple it has started what we call white friday which is uh, somewhat modeled after you know for all the research students somewhat modeled after break the, the naming is obvious it's not uh, the outcomes or the 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 verdicts are not so harsh it's just a feedback right now not not tell students you go home i mean finished you're done but you know that has just started and there is still debate among i don't know i think students like to there's a lot of debate among faculty whether this is uh, a good thing or not so what do you think having semester wise feedback uh, to all the students i think it's particularly useful because i think you can go for many years without receiving feedback and without actually 
someone investing the time in you to tell you what you should be doing different. The other thing Black Friday really helped was you would always get feedback from someone who was not your advisor. Uh, so the Black Friday letter and uh, the Black Friday committee at CMU would always be all the faculty, not just your advisor. And so you would es essentially be assessed in front of all the faculty. So that was really useful, right? Because there might be a different faculty who views your work differently apart from your advisor. There might be a different style of giving feedback, a different type of feedback that you actually resonate more with. So I think overall Black Friday was super useful. Like that's actually how I knew a lot of faculty at CMU as well. Okay. Now moving on, uh, what what difference do you find working in a so-called industry research lab like Meta Lab? Uh, you know, does it feel very different from working in a university research group, or or how is it different? So other than so other than GPU thing, resources and the money you get. So I think I mean industry research is I would say quite different uh, compared to academic research. One of the things that stands out is typically that um, in academic research, a lot of emphasis is placed on novelty, uh, on like the idea aspect of it. Like, are you novel? Are you not novel? Is the thing that you're doing new or not? Uh, whereas in the industry research, that part matters, but not as much. The thing that matters was is what you achieve with the thing. So you can take a method that is like 35 years old, not really, you know, invent anything new on top of it. But if you make it if you execute really well on it and if it works, that is success. So I think the thing that is sort of appreciated is slightly different. The other thing is the working style is quite different. In academic research, um, both at IIIT and at CMU, I think even if the groups are very large, you typically split up into very small sort of day-to-day -day operations, right? So as a PhD student, you're typically sort of encouraged to work on a single thing by yourself, publish first author papers, that sort of emphasis is pretty, I would say, baked into the system because that's what you need to graduate. That's what you need when you're applying for jobs. Whereas in industry research, you're essentially encouraged to work in a team. You're encouraged to work with people who are basically as good or even better than you. And they're all sort of working very hands-on, very much into the details. So it's not like you're the only one who's sort of executing and then there's a person who's advising. That sort of distinction becomes blurry and blurry as you move into industry research. Everybody, even the most senior people who've been here for like 30 years, 35 years, are still writing code, are still executing on things. And so that environment feels very different. Okay. So uh, uh, just to let others also know, Ishan was uh, among the MIT Technology Review 35 under 35 uh, award winners in the last year. Congratulations. Thank you. So how does how does life change after TR35, if anything? <laughs> no changes. No changes at all. I think it just, it's a good signal to know that what I'm working on is useful. Okay. That's very modest. So computer vision is a dizzyingly fast area today. So what advice do you have to a BTEC student? or a dual degree student here, or a PhD student who's starting on, on computer vision? Is it so daunting because, you know, a, maybe, I don't know, two dozen papers appear in any field on archive every week or every day or something. So how do you, how do you, how does the student supposed to cope up with all these when you are starting? Yeah, I think it's tough. I mean, I do not envy students who are starting now because I think I had it easy. Uh, many, many years ago, archive wasn't this popular. So my, I mean, my sympathies and empathy with all of you, I would say the main thing to really look at is one, what is your own skill set? So don't try to really compete on a, on a, in a field where you yourself, like you should be very self-aware of what your own skill set and what your own advantage or your own unique advantage is. And so, for example, if you're really good at understanding geometry, Overall, in the longer term, anyway, build that muscle, take the time, invest in yourself, invest in that research area, invest in your understanding and really build that. Say you don't understand 3D, you do not understand basically, you know, most of it, then don't do that. I mean, try to figure out what your own background and what your own interest and what your own skill is, really. And don't try to run after what is hot right now, because what is hot right now basically may not be hot in three years. 
and then is you've spent a lot of time working towards something which you were not naturally that interested in and in 3 years essentially that thing is not maybe very useful and you've not built the fundamental skill set needed to sort of make you successful later on so really try to understand what is it that you're good at and then what are you going to really pursue as an example uh, professor pjan used to teach us graphics computer graphics course and i really for the life of me could not understand the coordinate system stuff it was so hard i mean there were like there were aditya deshpande and ishan saying basically would spend like entire nights explaining it to me like this is coordinate and i would literally be doing this all night and i realized okay computer graphics is going to be really tough for me like i can be really good at something else or i can just try to do this all of my life and just not figure it out and so I did, that was actually i think one of my realization points that i would not do very well as a graphics person should i withdraw my grade your grade no i worked pretty hard for it <laughs> so uh, you have been pushing the cause of uh, self supervised learning you have been in the forefront you have been interviewed by by the tech blogs and everybody so what you know what do you think is the future of self self supervised learning in the larger ml landscape so i think fundamentally it's going it says already changed the way we view large scale algorithms because i think at large scale just getting supervision for every single task that you're interested in is impossible so self supervised learning is already changing that but i think beyond this when we move into embodied agents it's really going to be the thing that distinguishes uh any agent that is using self supervised learning from an agent that is not using self supervised learning you really want agents that are able to adapt and i think being able to adapt to a new environment requires a form of being able to collect data on your own uh, be able to reason about the data on your own and discover structure in the data on your own so i think that when we move towards more and more autonomous systems that are actually being deployed in real world to unknown environments we are going to see even bigger push towards self supervised learning because at that point that's really the only thing we know is going to be successful so uh you we have a uh, professor subbarao kambambati sitting in the audience is there something that you want to say so provocative that he'll come and 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 refute something no 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 right i i typically try to not say provocative things <laughs> okay so uh, one last question uh, or what is you know, the one thing triple it should include in its curriculum or training you know inside or outside uh, the classroom or uh, in the ugs that will help you know people become best better researchers in your view looking back you know you are 10 years almost 10 plus years out of triple it so i will say one thing that i did not appreciate as much and then i'll say one thing that i think can be added one thing that i did not appreciate very much was human values so i think when i was there it was useful i mean you were in my human values group and like i was very fortunate to have you uh like in the first one year of like that and then the jeevan vidya shivir um and of, of course professor kanan shrinathan was also with you so we had like i think i had like two of the like really sort of very very inspiring researchers in my group so that was very useful i th- i think at that point i i was able to soak in a few things but i did not appreciate how well it would resonate and i think 10 years now when i look back at it i'm so happy that we actually were given that uh, knowledge basically in our first year uh, and that sort of continued throughout because i think as a young undergraduate it's very hard to appreciate all of these details and all of these things that you'll get about life but 10 years from now i can tell you that's something that resonates with me and when i talk to a lot of my friends who went to triple it my juniors who went to triple it all of them agree on the same thing so all of them think that basically 10 years back when we were being told all of these things we were like eh, it's kind of useful maybe it's not very useful but now we realize it no it is really useful so i think thank you for all of that uh we are going to record this and play over and over and over and over to all the new incoming undergraduate students they are going to hate for you, hate you for it but love you 10 years after that yes hopefully 10 years after that yes they may not appreciate it then and that's fine i mean i didn't either but i do think it takes it takes time to appreciate that so this is the most common thing that happens in a value education course you know i i was in california last uh, june with and, and there's some few alumni and the one guy came and said most of them didn't talk about this but one one guy came and said that you know i really hated it then but now i know what you are trying to do and i i like it now so i think that's been yeah but 
so you are saying double the value education classes no double keep it the same <laughs> keep it the same i think i think too much of any good thing is also bad so i think let's just keep it at moderation where, where it was was perfect got it got it i think that 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 my fair enough so do you have any questions to me or to this, 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 this not be not supposed to be a one way dialogue but you know yes so i think for me the biggest question is like for you what has been the biggest positive change in triple id education in the past decade what is the most positive thing positive thing at triple id in the past decade like one highlight for you as your term as a director because i think you became a director right around uh when i was graduating or around that time or maybe after I, slightly i complete after. i complete 10 years in a in a month and i right. and i have asked uh, the higher ups to start looking for my successor and that has begun already so i right. may not be here for much long yeah i think we we grew uh, positive thing is i think our we, i i inherited a system that was extremely well made in 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 its fundamentals academic strength the people etc and uh, we scaled it up to to you know because that's a second or second decade of the of the institution we scaled up the research uh, activities uh one big visible thing is probably you know we are sitting in this kohli you know this is a kohli day we are sitting in the kohli research block so the the tcs foundation endowed us with in a total of about 50 crores so far in in establishing this building and scaling the ai related activities and we are we are easily we are rated the you know number 1 by far in ai you know to believe ai rankings dot org kind of thing uh, in india and but we are still rank about 88 or 90 or something depending on the time and hour that you look there because it's a dynamic <laughs> ranking system uh, so i mean we we were that that's the number that inspires us that 88 you should come down to 25 or something so i think scaling things uh, build, building build building on the foundation the academic strong academic foundation which is already there was been the the focus and i'm glad we have come come uh, some distance on it even though there's a long way to go thanks nice. and okay second question but this one is more important for me it's for my education what do you think are the missing ai opportunities tailored specifically to india so i understand at a globe in a global context there are many research areas many opportunities that exist but specifically for india and given that you've spent so much time basically working in this area you've seen students you've seen startups what would you think is the biggest missing opportunity right here i think the uh, ai of in, in so india is it should be uh, exploiting this ai opportunity a lot more by trying to solve its own vast and you know uncountable number of problem that exist in the, in its society so we have made, we have made a small beginning you know we have a, uh, a sub group here call we call it inai ina is integrating ai it basically the trying to look at uh, population scale problems and trying to solve apply ai techniques and other technology to to make societally relevant uh, solution for it so two fo- focus areas we have one is transportation or smart mobility second is healthcare in transportation a lot of stuff is happening you you may know about the idd the india driving data set that that gets updated and that now getting into uh, two wheeler you know how, how to get two wheeler safety I mean, it's not just data set for it's not only for uh, for autonomous driving because if you can drive autonomously in india you have solved all the world's problems right but it's about driver safety i think driver safety is even more required in india because our 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 uh, record of accidents and fatalities are disproportionately large compared to the kilometers driven or the number of uh, people vehicles out here and so on so so that's the focus we have a couple of projects running in 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 the in the field at nagpur roads trying to look at you know increasing the safety of the drivers the public transportation drivers with, along with nagpur municipal corporation and another project in telangana where the similar things uh, 300 bus fitted with uh, sensors driving in the in the highways not uh, the city roads and trying to see you know, how to improve uh, the the both the roads the the driving behavior driver behavior and in in overall accidents and fatality the second major focus area we have is healthcare which is you know which is where 
I think India's opportunities are there are. So we do have a couple of uh, projects. There's a there's a oral cancer project which is going around. People go around uh, in a bus to villages and take photographs with your mobile phone uh, of people and and see if you can like screen at least if not diagnose oral cancer, but at least screen for potential di 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 you know, oral cancer activities. And this is happening. This has been happening. And uh, so this is the space of public health where you want to really get to the, the people who, you know, the have-nots, not people living in Hyderabad mostly. And that's been a huge challenge, but that's where the big opportunities, uh, opportunities are. And no country can offer those opportunities like that, that India can offer in that. So this is a big opportunity. I, I don't think countries, uh, you know, is exploiting it enough, but that's where you know, we would like to focus on. And, uh, and like transportation, we, we work with the governments and a few transport departments and so on. It's easier to do. In public health, you have to work with the actual people in the village, the government department, the doctors, the collector, everybody. That takes a long time to, to get anything done. We have te teamed up with the Public Health Foundation of India. Government of Telangana is very supportive. Still, it takes a lot of time to, to at least come up with something that has impact on the ground. We have been writing, we have started writing papers based on the data that come, etc. But that's only the academic impact. How do you go to the, mm -hmm. the, the ground level impact? So this, I think it's a huge opportunity in India of, with, with all kinds of uh, data available because people, the, the, the mobile phone penetration is extremely high. And so we can do a lot of things with uh, for public good, education, healthcare, etc. So we are we are starting some project, but you know we're always impatient. We should achieve more. Okay, so I think we are uh, out of time. Thanks, Ishan, for joining from New York, and uh, thank you all. For thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank uh, you. Very grateful. Thank you.